Hair. It's one of those things you don't think about until you start losing it. For centuries, humans have struggled with this one universal truth. Our hair doesn't last forever. Balding has been a battle for both men and women across all cultures. We've tried everything to win this war. Pills, lotions, snake oils, trips to Turkey. But no matter what we try, all we see is that hairline receding and that bald spot creeping in, leaving us self-conscious and questioning whether we can pull off being bald like Jason Statham can. But now, with the rise of AI, we may be on the verge of something groundbreaking. Could this study have finally found the cure we've been desperately searching for? I first started noticing my hair thinning back in college. Obviously starting to lose my hair in my early 20s was not something I was super thrilled about, but I'm a big research and data kind of person, so I immediately did intense research on why we even lose hair in the first place. The first thing I found out is that hair loss is a lot more common than we think it is. The vast majority of men and nearly half of all women will be affected by androgenetic alopecia at some point in their life. That's the scientific term for the most common form of hair loss. The main culprit behind it is this guy, dihydrotestosterone. Over the course of the life of an adult, 10% of testosterone naturally converts into dihydrotestosterone, or DHT. DHT is responsible for growing the hair everywhere on your body. Everywhere except your scalp, where it actually causes the hair follicles to shrink, making your hair thinner and thinner, until the follicle is too small to grow hair at all. This happens because DHT sticks to the androgen receptors of the follicle, where it helps to make more oxygen-free radicals which are these highly reactive molecules that damage the DNA of the follicles. That's why hair loss caused by DHT usually happens in specific patterns, like the receding hairline and thinning of the crown. This happens because the hair follicles in these areas have more androgen receptors and are more sensitive to the effects of DHT. These patterns are so predictable that doctors develop this scale, which helps to classify how far along someone's hair loss is in seven stages. I think I'm entering stage three probably. Let me know what you think. So basically more testosterone makes more DHT, which makes more oxygen-free radicals. Those oxygen-free radicals are super important to remember because that's where the AI will try to find the cure. As you mature, your body makes more testosterone and therefore more DHT. That's why men start losing their hair only after they're fully matured, when our bodies are producing lots of testosterone as adult males. This helps to explain why going bald could actually be a good thing. Multiple studies show that women perceive bald men as more attractive. The reasoning behind this from an evolutionary perspective is that women are subconsciously attracted to men they perceive as being more mature, men with more testosterone that can create healthier offspring. There's also studies that completely contradict that, but I'm choosing to ignore those. <laughs> this connection between testosterone and hair loss is also why men experience hair loss more frequently than women, because we have more testosterone and so more DHT. Women do produce testosterone and DHT, but when they're younger, they naturally make enough estrogen to block the effects of whatever small amount of DHT is there. But as they get older and produce less estrogen, especially after menopause, thinning hair makes its unwelcome appearance in women too. But it's also not as simple as DHT bad, so if I have less of it, I won't be bald. There's lots and lots of factors that contribute to hair loss. Genetics, vitamin levels, skin problems, diet, hormones, drug use, stress, cosmetics, childbirth, sleep, age. So basically anything we do as human beings will make us lose hair. It's an unavoidable fact of life. Which is why as long as humans have existed, we've been trying to find the cure by using whatever is the most advanced technology we have at the time. Take a look at this painting. This guy here is balding. And so is this one here too. These depictions from ancient Egypt are over 3,000 years old, and they show lots of men balding and with receding hairlines. These are some of the oldest depictions we have to show just how long we've been fighting this war with hair. This is the Ebers Papyrus, the oldest medical text ever found. And in it, ancient Egyptian doctors included information about a mixture that could treat hair loss. I got it pulled up on my computer here, so let's look at some of the ingredients. We got iron oxide, onions, honey, and fat from snakes, crocodiles, and hippos. Oh, but the mixture doesn't work unless you pray to the sun god right after. <laughs> In ancient Greece, Hippocrates tried to find a cure for his own hair loss. 
What he came up with was also a mixture, which had horseradish, beetroot, pigeon droplings, and some other spices, along with some opium just for that extra hit. Over time, we figured out these mixtures weren't working, so instead we opted for covering up the hair loss with wraiths, helmets, and later wigs. But by the 1800s, our understanding of chemistry was growing, so we went back to trying new mixtures. There were hundreds of different hair loss remedies on the market, each one advertising hair loss as a disease which needed a cure. These cures usually ended up being completely bogus and some even deadly. This is actually when we got the term snake oil salesman. American entrepreneurs were mixing snake oil from China with different herbs and chemicals and cocaine to make remedies that they marketed as cure-alls for any illness, including hair loss. By the 1900s, we were advancing technologically, so we tried new high-tech solutions instead. Like this thermocap device, which used alternating electric currents, magnetism, and blue light. It could supposedly nourish hair follicles and awaken dormant hair roots. We were literally just throwing shit at the wall and hoping something works. Thankfully, by the 70s, the science got more serious. After multiple clinical trials and tests, we developed a pill called minoxidil, the first clinically proven hair loss medication, which both reduced the rate of hair loss and helped to grow back hairs that have been lost. In 1988, a minoxidil lotion was approved for sale under the brand name Rogaine. I want to know more about Rogaine. Rogaine with minoxidil? Yeah! Anybody else? Yeah! yeah. Okay. This lotion had some real success for people, but its marketing still fed into the idea that bald men were diseased and less attractive and undesirable. Will she feel the same way if you lose your hair? Sure. She'll just feel it about somebody else. Plus, Rogaine doesn't work for everyone. Going through this Reddit forum, you can see countless examples of people who haven't had luck with Rogaine or any of the other newer treatments. This forum has over 270,000 members. Scrolling through it, you can really start to see just how many people have deep, deep insecurities about losing their hair. They're trying everything, and many are left with little to no improvement after years and thousands of dollars spent on all kinds of treatments. They're desperately searching for an actual cure that works, which is why this new study looks so promising. In the study, scientists from Qingdao University specifically targeted those oxygen-free radicals, Remember, oxygen-free radicals are those molecules that are directly responsible for damaging hair follicle DNA. The researchers developed a machine learning model to predict chemical compounds which might be effective in fighting these molecules. The AI was trained with a giant database of chemical compounds to find the answer, to discover something that we couldn't. Once the AI was trained, it spat out multiple potential compounds for the researchers to review. The researchers went through the results and looked at the compounds they thought looked most promising. They focused in on this one, Manganese thiophos what is it? Manganese thiophosphite. They synthesized small sheets of the compound, which they first tested on human skin cells in a lab. The test confirmed that manganese thiophosphite successfully reduced oxygen-free radicals in these skin cells. The AI found something that can effectively fight these hair-killing molecules, and it did it with no negative side effects to the human skin cells. The next step was to test the compound on mice to see if it remained safe and effective on living organisms. The researchers chose mice because they're the most common animals tested on, but also because mice suffer from the same androgenetic alopecia that we do. For mice, the hair loss usually happens in large spots on their back, and sometimes on their head, like in this little guy here. The researchers attached small micro-needle patches to the mice's backs to deliver the compound. After 13 days, the mice were growing thicker and denser hair, and the hair completely covered their bald spots. Not only that, but if you look at this photo, you can see that the hair that grew back was twice as thick than in the control group, which was given minoxidil. So this compound that was just found by an AI was already getting better results than the best medication we had on the market for the last 50 years. Decades of research went into minoxidil and all those other hair loss treatments, and AI just found something even better in minutes. That's the real superpower of all these new machine learning models. Nowadays, when someone says AI, we usually think of ChatGPT or deepfakes. But the whole world of scientific research is going through a complete AI revolution. This discovery to treat hair loss is just one tiny example of all the incredible progress that's happening in scientific research right now. So many discoveries and solutions have been found by just letting AI do the heavy lifting. It's a completely different way of approaching science. Before, we had to do the time-consuming, complicated work to find answers in massive datasets. But now, AI does the crunching of the numbers, leaving us to just review and test what it finds. 
It's very exciting for people who have tried so many different treatments, but haven't had much luck. Now there's a long road between mouse tests and human trials, let alone the years it takes for the FDA to approve the medicine, if they even approve it in the US. The team behind this study is from Qingdao University in China. Because of the tension between the two, American lawmakers have been banning Chinese biotech and pharmaceutical companies. So this medicine could end up being in political limbo for years. It's just so sad that we're letting political tensions limit scientific progress. But still, the future is hopeful. After millennia of fighting our war with hair, we might have finally found the cure. And it's a cure that doesn't require drinking snake oil or shocking your head with electricity. This is the kind of stuff we should be using AI for, to solve problems and advance our species into the future. But a lot of the time, AI just ends up creating new problems. Or it rapidly destabilizes systems that we've relied on for years, like work, education, entertainment, even democracy itself. The election is less than a week away, and the entire internet is completely run over by AI bots that spread political disinformation. I investigated that topic in my last video. If you haven't had a chance to check it out, I highly recommend you do. It's especially important right now, right before the election. This discovery is huge news for all the people that struggle with insecurity because of hair loss. For most people, hair is a key part of their self-image. We place a lot of significance on hair, and losing it feels like you're losing a part of yourself. A lot of these attitudes come from those snake oil salesmen back in the day, who spread this idea of hair loss as a disease. When really, losing hair happens to most of us, and being bald has no negative side effects to it. Maybe we need to reframe hair loss as something that's natural, like being left-handed, and not as a disease in need of a cure. That's how I look at it. I've personally never had too much insecurity about hair loss, honestly. I grew up with family members that have always been bald, so it's always been something that's completely normal to me. I'm also Eastern European, and we all get buzz cuts at like 15, so I don't give a f Thanks for watching this episode of Digital Footprint. If you haven't subscribed yet, now's your chance. A new episode comes out every two weeks, each one examining how technology affects our society. So make sure to subscribe to stay updated on future posts. I'd also love to hear your thoughts on this topic, and also on what kind of topics I should cover in future videos. You can leave a comment or email me. Thanks again for watching. I'll see you in a couple weeks.